Okay, without further ado, Ted, uh, you're our speaker on how do we accept the unacceptable. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay, great. Um, I, I thought the unacceptable I would have to accept tonight is not being able to do this because I couldn't get the link. So I'm glad to be here linked up with you all right now. Can you all hear me? If so, wave your hands or do something. And Great, wonderful, great. Because um, I can't tell with the, you know, the, the mutations here. So anyway, <laughs> sounds like a musical group, the mutations. But anyway, uh, tonight's topic, accepting the unacceptable. And Lord knows there is a lot of that going around. So we'd start, I'd like to start with that prayer that we're all familiar with, the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Tonight we're talking about that first petition the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And I think, at least for myself, if I'm honest, if I want to complete that sentence, it would be, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change to my will, my plans, my expectations. In other words, what I consider to be unacceptable. And, and that is, I think, because I perceive this, whatever it is that I'm thinking to be unacceptable, as not being for my good or benefit, or for the good or benefit of those I care about. I perceive it to be that way because I have my own idea of what's good and desirable. Uh, we might say that somehow or another, uh, we become attached to our outcomes of how we think things should be. There's an old Buddhist story, I'm sure you may have heard it many times, about the farmer, his son, and the horse. And the farmer and son had a horse, and one day the horse ran away. And it was the only horse they had and the only thing they could use to take care of the farm. So all the neighbors came running to lament with the farmer and said to the farmer, we're so sorry to hear this, it's terrible news. And the farmer said, how do you know this is bad news? And the next day, lo and behold, the horse returns. And it returns with a team of wild horses. And the neighbors all come to celebrate this. And the farmer says, how do you know this is good news? And the next day, the farmer's son, out, out, his son is out there trying to tame one of the wild horses, and he breaks his arm. So this is the father's right hand breaking his arm. And all the neighbors come to lament, and the father says, how do you know this is bad news? And the next day, a warlord comes by and conscripting young men for the military. And he sees the broken arm of the farmer's son, and he passes him by. And on and on it goes. But the idea here is the, if you want to say the detachment or the non-attachment that that farmer maintains throughout to the outcome that others think should be. So for tonight's purposes, let's call this attachment, or if you will, um, this insistence that my will be done, an expression of our ego. Not ego in the healthy sense of who I am, because we all need to develop a healthy sense of ourselves, a healthy ego, a core. But ego, as in the case of a two-year-old of whatever chronological age, who wants what they want, when they want it, in the way they want it. Sort of like the ego on steroids. An ego that re expects the world to reflect its own expectations or wishes. Narcissism. Now, one hopes that as this two-year-old grows older, they learn that life does not roll that way. But yet, even with the best upbringing, remnants of that kind of ego remain. And I think if we look a little deeper, we'll find egoisms, if we can use that word, egoisms, source is anxiety. That is, 
if I don't get the outcome I want, as I want it, when I want it, then I won't have enough. I won't be enough. I won't be loved enough. And if you really scrape it down, the bottom line is I'm not safe enough in this world. And we all have these anxieties in some degree or another. Brother David Stendhal Rast, who is an American Benedictine, was raised in Austria during the Third Reich. I'll talk a little later about him and the whole understanding of gratefulness that he developed and has made, if you will, popular. But in the meantime, in an interview with Krista Tippett on the iPod on Being, Brother David explained that when we feel that kind of anxiety, when we feel that we are in a tight spot, if you will, we resist. And he noted that the roots of the word anxiety have to do with this sense of being strangled or choked. And the very first time we experience that sensation is when we are coming through the birth canal. Of course, we did not have the consciousness then to reflect on that experience, but the body and the brain remember. And as we live life, we feel a certain anxiety whenever we get in a tight spot, whenever we feel we're facing something that's unplanned, unexpected, outside our comfort zone, or frankly, in a word, unacceptable. And what we tell ourselves in these moments the images, the words, the ideas, the memories, the fantasies, they become our fears, mental concepts, mental constructs. And the fear which comes from that anxiety arouses that ego to rise up, to resist, to assert itself in fight or flight. In other words, to not accept. Now, those of you who have a musical background, uh, I don't. Um, I rely upon Jack for that. Um, may recall that in order to learn the lines of the treble clef, E, G, B, T, F, F, you learned a mnemonic. Every good boy does fine. So I'd like to suggest that mnemonic for us tonight and in this way. Ego gets between desire and fact. Ego gets between desire and fact. The irony is that the resistance that we address this with leads to distress in itself. It's one thing to experiencing a distressing situation in its rawness. We have feelings, we have emotions. But we compound the distress, we compound the emotions when we resist. Think of those what I call Chinese finger cuffs. Do you know what those are, those little straw things, okay? When you put your fingers in, they lock. Now, if someone says, take your fingers out, what's the intuitive thing to do? Pull your fingers out, but what happens? It gets tighter. You're stuck. The counterintuitive thing is to go into it. And as you go into it, it loosens and that creates a freeing. It releases the fingers. Perhaps you've experienced the same thing with a muscle spasm. You know, when we experience that, we tighten up, we want to contract, and then the pain increases. The counterintuitive thing is to let go and ease into it. The pain will have its moment but the muscle will soon relax. Last week, Donna talked about going into those dark emotions that we have, especially during these days. And in order to get out, if you will, we must go through. And in order to go through, we must go in. In other words, we must release our resistance whenever our fears are telling us that this is just not acceptable. It might be a good time here to say what acceptance is not. Acceptance is not saying we like a situation or a circumstance. 
It's not saying we wish for it or that we are choosing it. Often these painful, difficult situations evoke very intense, powerful emotions. For example, sadness. We experience, we're experiencing that these days, that kind of sadness, loneliness, hurt. We experience deep emotions just from living life. But resisting or fighting, in other words, trying to get out of it by, you know, those finger cuffs, can complicate the distress. It can lead us to do all sorts of things to, quote unquote, escape, some of which, as Donna alluded to last week, may not be very healthy for us. So let me just share what I think here is what I would like to uh, define as acceptance. If I can find it here. Oh, my. There we go. Okay. Acceptance is lessening the ego's resistance to that which is perceived to be unacceptable. And the image is there, the clenched fist, the open hand. It's the difference between holding tightly, resisting, and openness. It's unclenching our fist, if you will, in order to open our hand for what God wants to put there. Acceptance is about unclenching our fist in order to open our hand for what God wants to put there. And that's where we're heading to this evening. So acceptance is not denial. It's not minimizing. It's not dulling pain or sadness or any of those emotions. It's acknowledging it. And by acknowledging it, sitting with it, facing our fears, Remember, our fears are what we tell ourselves about that tight feeling we get, our anxiety. It's acknowledging those. I'd like to share another memory device that um, I learned from a friend of mine, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, Asha George Geiser. She's a, an Episcopal priest and a psychotherapist in the Diocese of Pennsylvania. And she doing, was doing a presentation on facing our anxieties in this time of pandemic. And she outlined the four sources of our fears, the four sources of our fears. And she came up with this particular um, memory device, which I think is, can be helpful. FACE, F-A-C-E. Our fears are composed of our fears, attachments, control, and entitlements. These are the things that get operated in our mind and complicate our ability to accept our fears. They're the lenses through which we sometimes look at things that present us with anxiety, that disturb us. First, fears, fears of loss, of pain. And I think most of all, I think the fear is that we will not have what we need in order to face the difficulty that we're facing. I think it's that fear of not having enough or not being enough. And then there are our attachments, attachments to outcomes and expectations attachments to who we think we're supposed to be or who others are supposed to be or how we think they should be or how things ought to be. What, one, of the, one of the great um, takeaways, if you will, from the 12th step, the Al-Anon world, is this idea of realizing that one cannot attach one's expectations to another person's addictions and recovery that letting go of those attachments can also help us to open our hand a little bit more rather than that tight fist-like resistance. And then there are our controls. I would call them our control fantasies. 
because it's a magical thinking kind of thing, which somehow pretends to manipulate a situation by sheer force of our will. In other words, trying to act beyond our pay grade. And finally, there are our entitlements, what we think we're entitled to, or should or not, should have or not have, should suffer or not suffer. Sometimes these become obstacles to our ability to let go of the resistance. Fears, attachments, control fantasies, entitlements, they all contribute to that kind of resistance. And the antidote, I think, to this resistance is a posture of, and again, using the image of the hand, openness to what we are facing. Doesn't mean liking it, doesn't mean feeling warm and good about it. It means being open to what is going on in that moment. It lies from that, it's that movement from the clenched grasp of our resistance for our fears, attachment, control, entitlements to the open hand, which allows us to receive much more than we could ever grasp to hold on to. When you think about it, you can't hold much in a closed hand. You can hold a lot more in an open one. So let's call these um, practices that we're going to talk about tonight. I'd like to suggest three practices that can help us to develop and maintain that posture of openness, which is really another word for acceptance. You might call these practices virtues. And virtues really are nothing more than actions which have become habitual. Actions which have become habitual. And they're virtues because they lead us to a life of serenity, which is rooted in a trust that God's love and mercy are calling us to a new and more abundant life. Now, that kind of openness or acceptance is a far cry from a grudging acknowledgement of something we don't like or don't want. Sometimes we think that's acceptance. All right, if that's the way it is, I'll just have to live with it, blah, blah, blah. Well, that eventually becomes anger. And that anger can get turned inward and become depression. It can turn outward and become aggression, either active or passive. And I think these practices will help us to face our resistances, and what lies underneath them. They may help us to work through them with the trust that God is doing work within us and providing us with more than we can ask or imagine. And the practice, to use the word practice of these virtues, is a reminder that acceptance is not a one and done process. It's much like forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice, and it's an intention to move in a certain direction and to choose it again and again. It's especially true when we have to deal with something like an ongoing crisis or a difficult relationship or a life circumstance or an illness, just to name a few. Perhaps the practice of these virtues will help us in making that choice for an abundant life, to move forward rather than staying stuck. So now let's look at these three virtues. And I'd like to name three of them tonight. There are certainly many more, but I just want to focus on three. Gratitude, humility, and presence. Gratitude, humility, and presence. First, gratitude. Brother David, whom I mentioned earlier, spoke and wrote a great deal about the virtue of gratitude. I'm going to put up the, the very simple website here, and you can see there, gratitude.org. It's very simple. It's a great website, and it has a lot of ideas. There's a word for the day. There's a gratitude journal. There's some videos, audios, all sorts of things, resources 
that can help cultivate this attitude of uh, gratitude. Brother David says, one doesn't have to be grateful for everything, but that one can be grateful in every moment. Big difference. We may not be grateful for everything, but we can be grateful in every moment. So we may not be particularly grateful that we're perhaps lost a job or developed an illness or had some other crisis happen to us. We may not be grateful about that, but we can have an attitude. And again, notice this idea of the open hand being developing an attitude of openness to what we can learn in that. There's the gratitude. Gratitude is about being present to the moment and what God, what life is calling forth from us. See, the anxiety paralyzes, much like that finger cuff. It gets us stuck. Gratitude frees. And gratitude leads me to believe that in this anxious moment, hearkening back to that very, very, very first one we had, in this anxious moment, there is another birthing. There is another birthing. Gratitude helps me to unclench my hand as I go into and through this moment to open my hand in the trust that God is giving me more than what I was grasping to hold on to. Brother David suggests just a three-step process here. Stop, look, go. First stop. That has certainly been forced upon us. Whether we like it or not, we have been, if you will, forced to hit the brakes, to stop. When life, life is very busy for folks, sometimes that has to become a discipline that one develops, whether it's using a timer on a watch or something like that or on a phone, to just stop. I, I often think that, you know, kind of in our, loca our, our locales that we miss out on some of the things that other folks in past have had, namely the ringing of church bells, which called us to pause at certain times of the day. Um, where I grew up, there was a Polish church on the corner, and you know, when somebody died, the bell tolled. It made you just stop and reflect what was going on. So stop. The second one is to look, to be aware. Notice what has been and what is being given to you. Starting with the breath that you and I take, and I would add, take for granted. Another word for this looking is to behold. You know, whenever in the scriptures we hear the word behold, we know something important is about to be said. Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, for unto you is born a Savior. Behold. This ain't just looking, this is beholding. Something important is happening. So by beholding, when we really behold, we learn to see that there is more to this moment than may meet the eye. The poet Maya Angelou reminds us, this is a wonderful day. I've never seen this one before. That's beholding. I've never seen this one before. Stop, behold, and then go. What's being asked of you in this moment? It may be an action. It may be a word of thanks. It may be a gesture of praise. In any case, the practice of gratitude leads us to a deeper seeing and responding to all that is being given. And it's connected to a joy that cannot be taken from us and that can sustain us even in difficult moments, in those tight moments when anxiety wants to grip us. They're deeply linked, gratitude and joy. Happiness comes and goes. It's overrated. Joy is lasting. What are some of the practices to cultivate the virtue of gratitude? Something as simple as grace before a meal. When we contemplate that there have been a whole chain of events that have brought the food to our table. A gratitude journal. Or just stopping in the course of the day and taking in the breath that we take for granted recognizing the many graces and mercies which come our way. You know, before I um, was involved in the Episcopal world, um, 
I didn't realize, I didn't hear this term. And then I heard it when I was going away, Jack and I were going away to Florida. They said, well, travel mercies, travel mercies. I thought, what is these travel mercies? Until we got on the road and these nice things happened along the way that I didn't anticipate. And I said, that's a travel mercy. <laughs> these are the things that come our way, which are unbidden, unsolicited, unearned, and quite surprising at times. And as we practice this virtue of gratitude, our hands unclench, not only to receive the gifts already given, but to stay open to what God may be giving us in this moment, that perhaps our instinct is to say, not, not acceptable, not good, can't do it. The next virtue is my favorite because it's one that... Um, is the one that's going to either get, keep me out of heaven or send me quicker to hell, and that is humility. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Not that it's that you, we demean ourselves. On the contrary, the practice of humility helps us to see ourselves in context, not getting above our pay grade. We're not cheating ourselves either on the other side. That we're not the be-all and the end-all and certainly not the arbiter of what should be. It's the recognition that God is God and I am not. <laughs> When we think life is unfair or that we've gotten a raw deal or difficulty in accepting the so-called unacceptable, it's connected to our feeling of being insulted sometimes by God or another or life and asking, don't you know who I am? Humility leads us from asking, don't you know who I am? To asking, well, who am I? Who am I that I should be spared this unfortunate situation? And because humility helps to put ourselves in context, we can ask that question from another perspective. Who am I? I am a beloved child of God in whose eyes I am precious and from whose love nothing in this world or beyond will separate me. It's closely linked to gratitude, this humility, because it moves us from demanding what I want, when I want it, and the way I want it toward a posture of trust that God will give me what I need, when I need it, and in the way that I need it. Why? Because of who I am, God's beloved. This was really reinforced for me recently in, in the uh, words of a a Roman Catholic priest from Wilmington, Father Bill Lawler. I've known him for many years and we lost contact over the years, but most recently he reappeared again on Facebook as he was kind of blogging about his diagnosis and dealing with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He died last Wednesday or last week, I'm not sure what day. He was about 73 years old, young man, great sense of humor, very honest and open about his re uh, recovery. Um, a very kind man, great preacher. And he, this is one of the things he put in his blog. And, and, and I just wanted to capture it because I think it really emphasizes what this humility is about. He wrote, I know that asking why doesn't help. Why is a science question that looks for causes. Faith instead says God's love includes this. Our, my brokenness, weakness, sin is included in God's love. God wants all of me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And God wants to love all of me and you. God not only loves the good me or you, when I'm in my Sunday best, but also whatever is broken and needs healing. When I don't or won't have a leg to stand on, all I can do is fall. 
at the feet of the master. This I believe and this I will do. It was a very, very powerful declaration. Father Richard Rohr has said that we should look for at least one humiliation a day. He doesn't mean that in the sense of being shamed. He means that in the sense of our being brought down to earth. And as you know, the word humility is rooted in the word humus, meaning earth. We don't have to go too far to experience the so-called insults to our persons, do we? Someone cutting us off in line, someone correcting us, someone ignoring us, the aches and pains of life, the inconveniences, the setbacks, the delays in our plans. In each of those moments when we are tempted to say, don't you know who I am? We can choose to respond with humility. Who am I? And once planted back on earth with the rest of the mere mortals, we can then answer, I'm a beloved child of God whose love embraces me as I am. Humility is also exercised when we acknowledge what lies within our power. Simple gestures like reaching out to others, asking for forgiveness, or as we say in the serenity prayer, the courage to change the things I can. The last virtue I want to talk about is the practice of presence. We might call it staying in the moment. When we want to get too far ahead and conjure up fears and catastrophes about what we perceive to be an unacceptable reality, we can reel ourselves back to the present moment. We can affirm that in this moment, all is as it needs to be. Or in this moment, God is giving me what I need. By taking deep breaths, we can act this out in a very physical way. And doing so actually brings some peace and calm because it activates that parasympathetic nervous system that we heard about a few weeks, for the past few weeks. We can also use our senses to ground us. Just stopping and something I see, something I hear, something I smell, something I touch, something I taste, being in the present moment. Now that fight or flight thing comes in handy if we're being chased by a tiger or looking down the barrel of a gun. But uh, it usually, for the majority of the other times, the danger's in our head. How we perceive or think about something. It's our resistance. It's what we talked about earlier, how we construe a danger or our response to it, and therefore label it unacceptable. It's like being all suited up for battle with no enemy to fight, except the one in our head. Using simple exercises of presence in the moment can help us take off our armor and ground ourselves in God's ever-abiding, loving, and compassionate presence. Presence. There are a number of apps and online helps that can assist in this practice. Just look for the word mindfulness. Look for centering prayer. These are both great ways of entering into this whole practice of being present. Present to the moment. Present to the God of the moment. So as you might imagine, these virtues don't happen overnight. They take practice perhaps taking each virtue, humility, gratitude, presence, and finding a way to put that into practice each day. Just simply. Be curious to know what practices work for others of us in the group tonight. Acceptance of certain realities, particularly ones that persist, like the crisis we are now in, require regular practice and discipline if we want to grow in that kind of serenity which accepts the things we cannot change. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, and I really appreciate that wonderful presentation. Um, at this time, uh, we are open to any questions if you'd like to ask 
something based upon what Father Ted shared with us tonight. Uh, you can either uh, text it to me and my telephone number is uh, in the group chat uh, and I will ask it anonymously or you can raise your hand and I will uh, turn your mic on so you can uh, ask Ted directly. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Carlisle, I think. Uh, Carlisle, go ahead. Ted, what yes, is your Carlisle. daily practice? Pardon? What is your daily practice? Where'd it go? Ted? <laughs> I think he just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> That was All right. uh, he, he should be coming back momentarily. Um, are you talking about a rule of life, Carlisle, or are you no, talking? Uh, I mean, there are any number of daily practices, you know, like centering prayer or mindfulness meditation or walking or whatever. And I'm very interested in what Ted's um, daily practice is. Okay. Well, hopefully he'll be back here in just a second. <laughs> Uh, would you like to share yours, Carlisle? <laughs> well, <laughs> mine is centering prayer, of course, or I have a slew of them. Um, um, I think I think just just going for walks is a fabulous practice. Um, but I'm I think I thought his presentation was absolutely fabulous, and so I just was um, interested to hear. There he is. You're back. Coming back in. I, I wasn't trying to get out of your question. <laughs> <laughs> Due to so, technical difficulties beyond my control. <laughs> I see. So just tell, tell us what your daily practice is. Practice. Well, I like, it's, it's kind of um, being a bit ADHD myself. Um, I find that I'm try, I try to be, make an effort of being present to what I'm experiencing or feeling in different moments, mm -hmm. particularly with regard to that whole thing about humility. When something's coming up or a difficulty I'm facing or some frustration is to really kind of just stop and pause and ask myself, okay, so what, you know, <laughs> so who am I, you know, and, and what might God be asking of me in this moment? I like the Psalms. I think, you know, particularly the discipline we've been doing through daily prayer um, with, as a parish. I like the Psalms. I think they're, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, provocative, provocative. Um, uh, moments where I deliberately take some time just to be silent, be still. Those are part of the practice. I, I can't say that I have like a every day at this, I will do that. That's not part of my if you will, the way I roll, as they say. But, um, but I think being, having it in front of me, I think that's the best way I can answer it. Having in front of me the, and the intention of trying to live, if I will, if you will, kind of a little more deeply, a little bit more below the surface yeah. and to kind of look beyond what's going on. I, I think that's the best way. I, I tend to be more, um, what's the word? Um, it curious curious is a word i use and i think that's a virtue as well curiosity it might have killed the cat but it's going to keep me healthy i think <laughs> thank you somebody else have a question they'd like to ask i won't shut it off if you ask a question i won't check out <laughs> <laughs> Ted, I put a quote up um, over oh. on the side about uh, it's falsely attributed to Lao Tzu. I don't think he actually said it, but somebody's attributed it to him. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. Mm. If you're in peace, you're living in the present. And, mm. uh, you know, when you were talking about f cultivating this this mindfulness of acceptance and, and mm -hmm. counting um uh, embracing with things with gratitude um mm -hmm. i i really think that's one of the ways that we can find uh, a way to hold on to the present moment and to be mm -hmm. in the present moment um it, certainly right now i know i've 
I have a lot of anxiety and I've heard a lot of anxiety about mm -hmm. exactly what is coming next. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, you know, just focusing on the now has been one mm -hmm. of the, the, the biggest helps for me in this time. So. And, and, and to piggyback on that, I think, uh, to, uh, again, to follow up with what Carlisle was asking, I think it's that idea of, of excuse me, trust in, trusting in providence. Um, I, I, for a long time, that, that image of God as provident is one that's been very helpful for me. Um, because I, I take the word, I like the word provident, to see forward, to see ahead, providere. And I think that in that sense, you know, when I want to get way ahead, I have to trust that God is bigger than what I can see a lot farther than I can see and is giving me what I need. So that sense of providence is, is really helpful for me. And I, I think the other side of it, too, is with dwelling in the past. Now, see, I, I, I'm a four on the Enneagram, so I really love going through you know, the past and you know, and just kind of ruminating around and get that sweet melancholy going and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I love my memories from the past. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned about the past that I like is that, you know what, through many dangers, toils and tears, I have already come. <laughs> it's his grace that brought me safe this far and grace will bring me home. So, I mean, that, that, that really helps me remembering those mercies, remembering those those graces that have come through along the way, have been, are very helpful to me. Anyway, that's amen. So. Preach it, Father. <laughs> yeah. What now, Lay, Lao Tse? Did you say Lao Tse? Is he yeah, is he from our parish? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Although we do have quite a few folks who follow Buddhist teaching and find it helpful, but. Um, uh, I think um, there's a whole thing on the internet about whether this is actually a Warren Buffett uh, quote. I don't know if. Oh, that was, uh, well, um, he certainly shouldn't have any age. anxiety, should he? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I asked that is she from our parish. He from our parish. I have to tell you this. I used that line <laughs> when I was a kid. We had this old uh, Boston pastor, Irish Boston pastor. And he was not worldly at all. And some friends took him to New York to see a show and took him out to dinner. And this was years ago in the 60s or something. And some of you may remember the singer Anna Maria Alberghetti. Do you remember that name? Or, yeah. Anyway, she was this famous singer. And they took him out to dinner and they were sitting in the restaurant. And he said, they said, look, Father, there's Anna Maria Alberghetti. And he goes, is she from our parish? <laughs> 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 okay. Anybody else have a question or a comment they'd like to share? Can I? Yes, please, Sherry. Go ahead. Okay. Well, actually, I, uh, Eleanor happened to walk by my house today, and so I briefly mentioned this. I was going to mention it last week. See, I don't want to, but talking about accepting the unacceptable, and I don't want to get, this is not a political thing, but I am having real problems mm -hmm. accepting mm -hmm. what I, accepting the political on what's going on in the White House. I, I'm having, uh, I can't change it. I can't control it. It's out of my control. Well, you know, Sherry, it's, it's an interesting question, uh, or an observation, too, because I do think that, you know, um, when we uh, normally we're healthy and somehow a virus or bacterium gets into us, our body rejects it. And I think that's a very healthy thing to do. Something that's not healthy, that's not good, our body rejects it. But how do we take care of ourselves while the body is dealing with that rejection? I think that's the place where I think we can come into how we live in that moment and how we live through that moment, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, we don't have to like the bacterium that's sitting in a certain place in this country, but we, we can certainly um, learn uh, you know, how to not... As somebody said to me the other day, it was on Facebook, and that's a that great place, everybody, you know, great um, talking place. They said they were having trouble, you know, but with their relatives who are, you know, of a certain political persuasion, and they can't change them and that sort of thing. And I, my thought is, don't go there. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't engage there. 
But at the same time, you know, I, I may not like this situation, but I'm going to have to love myself enough not to make myself sick about it and love the relationships I have with people, not to make those the deal breakers, if you will, you know? Okay, um, and, and we can talk about this again on <laughs> November 4th. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, if this reaches Canada, I'll be glad to talk with anybody. <laughs> I, would, I would just say too that um, I, I think we need to be seriously praying for everything in Washington right now. Yes. And I think the best thing that you and I and all of us can do is to live as faithfully as we can to what we believe is important okay. and to not return uh, 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 their bad behavior, what we perceive as bad behavior, with our own bad behavior. Um, mm -hmm. The prayer mm -hmm. of St. Francis, I think, That's is good. beautiful. Mm -hmm. A wonderful great. mantra to keep in in front of all of us, all of us. It's so. a tough. It's tough. It, it it's very tough. tough. It's very Absolutely easy. tough. Donna, you had a question. Donna's <laughs> muted. There she is. She's unmuted. She's muted again. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> She's like Schrodinger's cat. She's both in and out of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it was more, um, I was thankful for your reminder, Ted, about how um, dominant our egos can be sometimes mm. in trying um, to deal with what's unacceptable and how much resistance comes up. Because mm. I know for myself, when I think things should be a certain way and I have expectations, my tendency sometimes i hate to admit it but is to blame something or someone and um your reminders tonight and some of the imagery you use um were very very helpful oh, good. in reminding me about that so thank you oh you're welcome thank you uh ted i have another comment for you uh that someone's texted me um, it says thanks to carlisle i've become more able to identify the source of my anger in my anxiety and just notice it, stop it, and simply note it rather than getting into self-condemnation. Mm. But how can I intervene before the anxiety bubbles up into anger? I think part of it is how can I intervene before the anxiety bubbles up into anger? Good question. Because I think, you know, as, as I reflected, I think the anxiety kind of morphs into or taps into, if you want to say, that deep reservoir of our fears, our attachments, our need to control, and our entitlements. And I think sometimes, I think asking the question, and I think this is what Donna touched on last week, about even just sitting with it and saying, what is this about? What's going on here? Where is this coming from? Becoming curious. Um, I think Donna mentioned Tara Brock last week and the, the rain. Oh, is that, maybe we get confused, are they mnemonics or acronyms? But anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> are they mnemonics? Is that, whatever. But recognize, uh, accept, is that accept, acknowledge, investigate, inquire is the I, and nurture. What do I need here? And I think sometimes, at least for me, the anger may come because of it, either uh, an expectation that isn't met. There's an old thing that ex expectations that go unmet morph into resentments. And I think we're understanding what is the expectation here. I can be angry because I expect things to be different, but I mean, I can wish for the lottery, but it ain't going to happen. You know, so I mean, there are some things like particularly things that are above my pay grade, like expecting of another person to behave or change or act in a certain way. I I just don't, nor do I want that control. I think I do, but I, I really, that's a big responsibility. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that's helpful. I mean, does anybody want to add? Tom's got his hand up. Tom's there, got too. his hand up. So I just, want to, I just want to shift it back to, uh, uh, I think it was Sherry who uh, has trouble with what's going on in the White House. <clears throat> I have enormous difficulty with what's going on there. And mm -hmm. uh, I just have to say to myself over and over, well, one, I, I just watch less and less of the news on TV. Yes. Uh, 
I can deal with the troubling feelings, but I just don't have to be saturated with it. But one of the things I have to remember is this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. The difficulty with this too shall pass, Sherry, is that uh, there's a lot of damage being done that's going to take years yes. to correct in terms yes. of the functioning of ordinary, everyday people who work in government. They're leaving in droves, and, and, that's, a, and, and, and that's a huge loss that we're experiencing. So it will take a lot of repair. Uh, mm. and, and right now, I think it just takes a lot of patience. Um, and, and what we see there is the model of narcissism that, mm. um, that is just out of the textbook. It really, yeah. really is. And we, we need to be patient. Uh, what's difficult for me is uh, on Sunday in worship is to pray for him. Mm -hmm. And yet, mm -hmm. and yet, that difficulty is what I need to experience. And I do need to pray for him and, and for all who are in government. Uh, and so thanks for your question. Uh, we, uh, we, I too struggle, and yet um, this too shall pass. And, and uh, uh, we will wander out of the wilderness someday. I, I, you know, yeah, so that would be... Sermon. Well, no, that was good because it made me think this too shall pass and, you know, so, so shall a kidney stone, but it's going to be very painful till it gets That's out. Right. You know? That's right. Mm -hmm. you know? Ted, Ted, you did a really wonderful job. I love that quote, virtues are actions that have become habitual. I'm going yeah. to hang on to that. That's very you know, helpful. And thank there, you there's, for, a, there's thank a whole... You us, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thanks for taking us to, to Brother David. I, I love him. Oh. I love his work. In gratitude.com. So thank you for that. Well, there's a whole meme that goes with that actions and virtues thing. So let me just say it real fast because I didn't do the whole thing. Plant an act, reap a habit. Plant a habit, reap a virtue or a vice, depending on what the habit is. Plant a virtue or a vice, reap a character. Plant a character, reap a destiny. So you know, way, way back from that very act, things start to shape us and form us. So I think to your question, Sherry, about, you know, a lot of stuff's coming in and it is having a shaping influence. It is infecting us, if you will, and affecting us. And I think how we deal with those things, and again, to Tom's point about minimizing some of that contact you know i think that six feet away from the news could be very helpful too you know, <laughs> you know? social distance <laughs> the other thing is too you mentioned about the you know uh, how you just so riled up and the feelings that you have about for example what's going on politically and with the president and so forth and makes me think that before way before i got into a relationship i actually thought i was perfect that I really was, I was, I was doing quite well. Then I got in a relationship and damn did the shadow side start coming out. And I realized, boy, I could be a real mean cuss sometimes if I <laughs> get my back up. So, I mean, it, it just reminds me that even in this situation, this situation has brought out feelings in me. I have to tell you, I never thought I would feel about another human being. So it scares me. So I have to really, again, be aware of that and make sure that it does not um, become the narrative, become the theme for me. So I have to kind of just be aware of it because it's there. I'm not that bad. Ask Jack. I'm not that bad of a cuss. I mean, just a little bit. <laughs> What is it, Natalie? Jeff's I'm, muted. You're not, you're, you're not muted. Go ahead, Natalie. Ask your question. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you, Ted. That was a wonderful presentation. And Thanks. then I want to say, I think getting angry is a wonderful thing to do. Mm. And, well, people that know me know that, you know, what I'm thinking is not too far under the surface. <laughs> and I think it's very healthy to get angry occasionally mm -hmm. um, and therefore I'm not sure that I want all of my anxieties never to um, 
continue on until I get angry. The queen does get curdled on occasion. Now, the good thing is it doesn't... Did you bother. say the queen or the cream? <laughs> Me, the queen, does get curdled on occasion, but it doesn't, it never lasts long. And I have to say, by getting angry, I get rid of it, and then I don't have to carry a grudge, yes. which I think is a much more, it's a, seri a more serious offense to me than just getting angry. Well, and I think you're, you're I think, we, you know, what I get from that, Natalie, is that there, there is a certain reaction that we're going to have, and what we do with it. It's like that old story about the two wolves that are battling inside. You, you all heard that one about the two wolves inside the Indian, or what is it? Is it a, a, a child asked his grandfather, you know, what, the grandfather says to him, he says, you know, inside of me, there are two wolves battling every day. One is very mean and vicious and, and, and aggressive. And the other one is docile and peaceful and gentle. And they're fighting every day. And the little boy asked the grandfather, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one I feed. Right. So well, I, I, no, the one that's docile is not necessarily the um, primary one in me. Good to know yourself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is there anybody else who's got one a question or uh, before we give Ted the last last summation, if there's any final thoughts? <laughs> the last rites. <laughs> Any other hands going up? I'm not seeing anyone. So Ted, do you want to, anything you want to close with or say before we say goodbye? That's all folks. <laughs> all right, well our speaker next week um, uh, will have to do her darndest to top Ted's excellent job. Um, it'll Who be it? uh, Mother Carlisle Gill and- Oh, uh, well. Carlisle will be talking about uh, how do we call upon our spiritual resources. Carlisle, is there anything you want to say or um, have us think about before we get together next week? Um, yeah, I, I'd like everybody to think about your own spiritual practice and what's, what's working for you during mm -hmm. these times and also to think about what you'd like to learn. Mm. Okay. Okay. That work. Great. Yes, it does. Well, I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in and joining us tonight, and and Ted um, for uh, joining the excellence that uh, in the weeks that have gone before. Um, I hope you'll come back and join us. Feel free to uh, share and invite uh, any friends that you have. They don't have to be members of the parish. Um, to participate in this conversation. And if you want to re-watch so you can take down notes, uh, this video will be up on YouTube very soon. So I wish you all a good evening, and I pray that God will uh, guard you and all those you love and protect you through this night and into the days and weeks that are to come. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you all. Thank you. Blessings. Namaste.